Connected CWE Video Podcast Week 15. This is the most committed I've ever been to something in my life. I've never dated a girl this long. I've never stuck to a diet this long. But here we are, 15 weeks in, CWE Video Podcast. We have a very special guest this week, wrestling veteran, superstar Todd Bullet. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. We're, we're supposed to have one more here, but he seems to be missing in action, and that could be because he's a little bit of a wild man, per se. <laughs> uh, wild Man Furpo was supposed to be on the program with us this evening, but we don't know where he is. Where's he at? I don't know. I saw him New Year's Eve, and that's the last I heard from him. Does he drive a vehicle? Like, he's pretty crazy. Like, do they give people like him a license, or do you walk from the bush? Where does he drive from? <laughs> from the bush? I, I think he came from the bush originally. <laughs> well, it is, it is alleged he's in a... <laughs> A very serious um, maternal affair with with Sarah Foster of the CWE roster, and maybe his wife didn't take too kindly to the time they're spent together. So it rumored he may be dead out in that bush. Is that something you can confirm oh, he, tonight? He's probably in the back forty. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of stuff going on in the world of professional wrestling today. Um, tons. I don't even know where to begin with all this. Um, I guess we can talk about something that's really plaguing WWE right now, because it seems like every week we're talking about it. Three more injuries announced today. Uh, Rusev, Sasha Banks, and Paige on the on the injured list. John Cena's on the injured list. Seth Rollins is on the injured list. Randy Orton. Randy Orton's Cesaro. Uh, it's uh, really starting to add uh, up here. Hey, so, your tryout's looking better and better by the day. <laughs> <laughs> so the box are opening up by the day. Maybe they can find Furple, man. They send him down there. Maybe, <laughs> guys, maybe, maybe, that's, okay. maybe that's where he's at right now. Maybe he got the call. He's with all that, man. Baggage um, claim. <laughs> so it's, not, it's never a good time for somebody to be injured, but this is probably the worst time as a professional wrestler to get injured because it's WrestleMania season. If you get hurt big going to that, fucking PO, you're, missing. you're missing out on a big payday. Yeah. And at this rate, it's going to be a completely new roster. They're going to have to just make NXT the WWE roster at this point, yeah, exactly. with everybody being gone, um, obviously every injury is different. But how long is it until people start saying this modern day professional wrestling style that WWE has stayed away from for so long, that's now very prevalent on their television, starts to get kind of restricted again? Is that something that we're going to be seeing in the future? You think? Um, if it's, I don't think they can really ban a style or restrict a style, but they can definitely, like before when they, they say, okay, no, no pile drivers, no chair shots to the head, no this, no that, they, they can ban specific moves, I think, but I, I think it's really hard because what, what encompasses a style, right? Yeah, but for a long time, there is a WWE style. Yeah, I guess say. they have those matches agented any way they want, right? For a yeah. long time, it was yeah. very standard that this was the WWE formula, yeah. and in the last couple of years, they've really opened that up, where for a long time, Monday Night Raw, you're, you know, six-minute match, eight-minute match if you were lucky, mm -hmm. and it was very cookie cutter or very fundamental anyways. Yeah. Now they're giving guys 10, 15, 20 minutes and they're going out there and they're fucking busting their ass. They're putting on the kind of matches you'd see on a Ring of Honor show, on a New Japan show. They're being very cutting edge and keeping up with the, the wrestling style that's current across the rest of the world right now. Yeah. Um, is that something that's going to change, do you think? It'll boil down to numbers. If it's if, if, if it's doing numbers for them, they don't give a fuck if you're getting hurt or not. They're, they're doing numbers. But, but they're investing a lot of money in these guys that are getting hurt. Maybe what they gotta do go back to the old AWA Vern Gagne style, sit on a headlock for five minutes and then take it off. Be the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think they have. Well, they're really big on like not like they, they, they like to keep the pace up now because people yeah. have such a short attention span. You don't want to be sitting on a hole too long anymore. It's it's if you do no. that, people are gonna turn the channel. Yeah. Like I I love wrestling. It's it's my passion. And I can put in good wrestling from any era. It could be from the 80s, 90s, now. It could be a phenomenal match, but all it takes is my phone buzzing, and it's like, yeah, I'm starting to do this, no matter exactly, what's yeah. on the TV screen. So the style does need to be fast. It does need to keep your attention. Yeah, you so captivating. And I noticed that like, when NXT first started, like they, they were really prominent with that style. I was like, well, it's going to be like the little pet project. They're going to mm -hmm. do NXT, and if somebody gets hurt, they'll bring in the next Indy Darling to take their spot. But now that it's progressing to be what it is, they need those guys. They need the the Kevin Owens. They need the the Finn Balors. They need these guys on the roster. So, is it going to be one of those things again where it's like, well, we're not going to be doing dives every match. You're not coming off the top rope all the time the way yeah. they used to. Is that something you think that's going to happen, or is it just going to be part of the course and maybe, we'll just load up developmental and have guys on deck? Maybe being thrown over the top rope will be illegal again. <laughs> I, I've been watching a lot of WCW on the day from the big night. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I guess it's kind of a wait and see. It'll all it'll all boil down to if this is just one rat. 
correlation doesn't prove cause, right? So this could just be a rash of injuries by coincidence. Right. Like, was Randy Orton working that style? Was Cena working? You know what I mean? Like, were these guys, were these injuries caused by that? Or were these injuries just... Well, Cena was suddenly working, was suddenly you know? working 20 minute matches every Monday Night Raw. But, but was is that, challenge, so is is that was, what caused the injury though? Who knows? Or is it just like a freak? But anytime you see a change like that, you wonder is that yeah. the reason why? Is this I, the cause I think that's a speculation. Just, you know, like, I used to joke around. Cesaro like, didn't change his work style at all. For, no. You know, like, he's all, he's, he just yeah, keeps doing what he's always done. Right? Because like, if you go and watch, like, the house show matches, like, they're pretty. They're pretty, they're pretty tame. Like, pretty tame. They're pretty tame. Like yeah. they're the WWE style of match. Oh, Some of the guys will pick it up in the main event. So you have you know your Seth Rollins or your Roman Reigns sure, or Ambrose. Yeah, like, they're know, going full yeah. tilt and they're they're doing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But before like the the NXT style or the more modern style became more prevalent on TV over the last couple of years, I used to joke as my schedule got really busy on the indies where I'm wrestling 12 to 15 times a month where I was expected to go out and wrestle 30 minute matches. Yeah. So if a promoter's flying me to this this state or this province. They're expecting to get their money's worth, so I had to go up there and do those kind of matches 12 to 15 times a month, and well, it yeah. beats your body up bad. Sure does. And, and, and it hurts. Like, my, my, <laughs> my body hurts from it. So I used to always joke, I'm like, I need to get that job so I can be doing six minute TV matches on Raw. Like, that'd be a nice, that nice was, change of pace. That's no longer be an option. That's not, that's not yeah. an option anymore. Like, you're going, you're going full tilt, and if you look at those Ring of Honor matches guys are doing uh, from match one to, to match end, they're going full too. The yeah. So the, the the business has really changed, and I'm going to touch on that with, with Todd later when we talk about his career. He's been around for such a span of different styles and generations. Um, is there going to be a time where guys have to cut it back again and stop being so innovative or stop going so hard because, or just saving it for when it's a little more special? The other question I just thought of too is we were kind of talking about this a little bit earlier today when we were just running through the injuries. Uh, one of them was Paige, and she just dealt with a concussion right now. Yeah. Uh, but I was going through and reading stuff. And banging and against preparation. the <laughs> In preparation for tonight, I, I was going through, and I guess she, she did an interview where she kind of was saying, you know, oh, I'm fine. Like, I'm totally fine. Like, it's just a very minor concussion. I can go, but they keep telling me that I'm not allowed because they have to be really off. careful. Yeah. So how many of these injuries that they have right now, 10 years ago, would have been worked through? Would Sasha Banks be working through her knee injury? Would... Uh, whatever whatever these injuries are, would, would guys be working through them? And maybe that's why there's more guys on the injured list now, because they're more careful. I think WWE is more careful because they're a publicly traded company and there's lawsuits going on with a band of wrestlers that are suing because of concussion issues they yeah, feel. Yes, yes. You know, they're trying to, you know, kind of copy that NFL yeah. lawsuit that's happening. And, and if you talk to, to guys... If you talk to the guys from back in that era when they were working 365 days a year, mm -hmm. you hear, like... Uh, either the office pressured us to keep working because if we, you know, we didn't, we'd lose our spot. And then you have the other guys that were more just like, well, it's my body and I, I, I want to make some money. I want to make some yeah. money. So we just suck it up. We pop some gimmicks and we keep on wrestling where WWE can't have that now because no, the guys are getting their head bashed in and and there's residual life on yeah. Pop some gimmicks, sleep. Wear a mask? Yeah. Oh my. So, so. Here's, here's my question. You might be able to shed some light on this. I know they, they do test for performance enhancing drugs amongst their, their talent. Do they test for, for gimmicks and like painkillers and stuff? Oh, oh 100%. Oh, they do. Oh, big time. Oh, yeah. So you can't run that shit. Yeah, if you, you can yeah, run they, it. They, they test for marijuana, that's right. Yeah. yeah, they're really big on that one, which is crazy because it's it's legalized a lot of places now. And that's like, but the U.S. is like a huge fight against marijuana. So oh, yeah. that one's a big one. Um, but from what I understand, if you have a prescription, you're completely you're fine. Okay. You're good. If you, But I think, I could be wrong, but you need to be approved by the WWE doctor for that script. So you can't just go like pay off some guy in yeah. a small town Arkansas and like, give you a script for whatever you're looking for and say, hey, I got a prescription. No, because there's always someone willing to take a PO to <laughs> write right. a prescription. But at the same time, if you're given a, if, if you blow at your shoulder and they give you a script for oxys and yeah. it says take you know, one every four hours or as needed, uh, and you piss your test and you've been taking four every four hours, yeah, then, then that shows that's, up and that's, that's a, still a yeah. violation of testing because you're now exactly. using uh, your prescription yeah, you're not gone, using for what it's worth. The, the dosage, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting time in that way. Like, um, I think 10 years ago, WWE would have just pushed guys through, like, maybe not forced because I don't know what the situation was, but if you were hurt, no. you were just, you know, that's like, that's how I broke into the business. Like, um, when I chained with Gene Swan, he was very adamant of that. He's like, get hurt, ice it up, wrap it up, keep on going. Like that's yeah, exactly, that's yeah. what we do. That's part of the business. And I've always done that. And yeah, like now at you know, thirteen years later, twenty eight years old, I maybe regret and you know, having that mentality for some of the injuries I had because you get the aches and pains that may sure, not have been yeah. there if you would have just taken the time to rest. But that was always the mentality that was put inside of you. Like just 
keep on wrestling. You're hurt. Suck it up. You can walk. Suck it up. I, I don't think the WWE, uh, like in the past, I don't think they directly, you know, came right out and said to guys, hey, you're going to lose your spot. You better keep fucking working here. That was just kind of a known uh, way of life. Without saying, saying. Yeah, it, went without, it just went without saying. Like Tito said, you know, he never messed a booking. And then he turned down a booking once because his, his wife was in labor and uh, Junkyard Dog was off on some fucking coke binge and so Vince, <laughs> called, oh, yeah. and so Vince called him and said like, hey, yeah, you want to go to Hawaii? Because it was a show in Hawaii and he's kind of like, no, I can't. And then he's like, okay, that's fine. I respect that. And then next thing you know, he went from the A crew, because they had an A crew, a B crew, and a C crew in the 80s. So he went from the A crew touring with Hogan and Piper and whoever else working all those guys getting these huge fucking houses to the C crew where he's working the executioner again and <laughs> <laughs> you know these 5,000 person houses and uh, you know getting his pay cut and he's on the C crew he said for a good like four or five six months until they finally kind of you know all right yeah. Yeah, you got your punishment. Move back. See, that's but they never flat out said, "Hey, this is right. why you're here." They just reassigned them. Okay, well, you, you, you need just to figure be, it out on yeah, your own. Yeah, okay, you need to be. It's just one of those things that go on yeah, because Ohio, if yeah. you're realistic, if you're in a top spot and you get hurt, someone's got to take that top spot. Yeah. Unless they drop the ball, they're going to keep yeah, that ball, yeah. regardless if you come back healthy or not. But even if they drop the ball, who's to say you're ready to come back? You know, like, like the timing has to work out. For your return to be right as they figured out, okay, this guy dropped the ball, but hey, this guy's back. In the game, right. So I think we talked about this on other podcasts. Like, it's not even a matter of a guy getting hurt and like, oh, he's hurt, fuck him. Um, like, even just yeah. running running local Con- shows. Content and we, to fill. Yeah, like yeah. when we when we uh, run a tour, we got you know 10, 12 spots of, of guys we bring on the road. It's a very small group, yeah. and I'm loyal to the guys that are coming consistently. Sure. So if a guy, you know, he's pulling his weight and he's performing to the level he's asked to, he's going to be asked back. Yeah. And once in a while, scoop your rats or nothing. Yeah. yeah. Um, once in a while, somebody will get hurt. So somebody sure. gets hurt, and and that's going to happen. They have to take time off. Well, you know, so and so is going to come in and and fill his spot. So as long as he comes in and he does everything that's asked of him, he's now gotten over. The fans are responding to him. I'm not going to kick him off the yeah, yeah, gonna do But there's still only so many spots. So that's now you're kind of, you know, sometimes you're now put back in line and you got to wait for a spot to open up so it's the right time to come back opposed yeah. to just coming back because you're ready to go. So yeah. a lot of wrestlers have that mentality where they don't want to show weakness or that they're hurt because they don't want to lose their spot or opportunity because those pushes don't come around all that often. It's true. So that's, the, that's going on in the injury of the world. Another on the other side of the world, um, a part of the big announcement we talked about last week was uh, the, the New Japan raid with WWE, uh, yeah. Nakamura being one of them, who's the Intercontinental Champion for New Japan Pro Wrestling. They actually announced today, I was just informed, that he's stripped of the championship, which is bizarre because he's supposed to be wrapping up his last date on January 30th, so instead of him dropping the title to somebody on the way out, they just flat They don't even want to feature him, is probably what it is. <laughs> I think, uh, and, and you know what, that's just kind of... My theory on it is that kind of goes to show what, what we're at in this day and age where, where wins and losses don't quite matter as much. Like They're like, okay, we don't want to put you in a prominent featured match, give you a rub on the way over to another company kind of thing. Fuck you. You think that's what it is? I, it could be. I, I can't say with certainty, but... Well, could there be could there be any like hard feelings there? Apparently, they gave their notice the day of the Wrestle Kingdom show like that morning, so that would be like if John Cena, Randy Orton, and... and um, the New Day all decided to uh, give Vince their notice the day of WrestleMania. That's basically the equivalent of what right. they did, right? Mm-hmm. So they told Gato the morning of Wrestle Kingdom that, that they were leaving. They were, that's when they yeah. gave their notice all at the same time. So could there be bad feelings there? That comes across like a slap in the face. I would imagine so, and I'm sure the story will come out over time, but you think with the way all those guys were featured and heavily pushed and the money they probably made for the organization, maybe... Yeah. Giving giving that notice on the biggest show of the year as they're probably planning their next year's worth of business probably wasn't the best way to do it. But money talks, and if that was the situation, who who knows what the offer was on the other end of the table to say, hey, let's go about it this way, and mm-hmm. let's, let's strategize it this way so it gets the most bang for its buck for them coming over to WWE. Mm-hmm. And who knows, like when Alberto Del Rio came back for WWE, he was the AAA champion. They didn't let him drop the title no. uh, before he left, so they had to That's vacate true. the title there. So it's kind of dirty pool on WWE's part because they used to be pretty big on letting guys finish up their commitments before going and, mm-hmm. and working for WWE, but with Del Rio they didn't let him uh, drop the strap and maybe maybe it's a situation like that like Nakamura's not under New Japan contract right now or his contract's up on that date Whatever so is, yeah. maybe it was a matter of well we don't want you doing a job on your way out yeah. so now he so doesn't just show up well that's the other thing too I'd like take the Del Rio thing for example too from their from their defense their point of view too 
he had already come back and won the U.S. title, Del Rio, when he, when he was still the champion, so he's already now a future performer for them. Do they want him going to another company and taking a loss? Right. If he had just signed with them, it was announced, and then he dropped the title before coming in, that, that might have been a little bit different, but because he came back as a surprise, he's now a future performer. The irony is funny, because we talked about this on the, the program before, everybody's like 50-50 in WWE, no one's like perceived as special, like Alberto Del Rio's lost that championship already, last he lost night, it last yeah. night. He's yeah. lost it twice, actually. Uh, has he? Yeah, because didn't he originally lose it to John Cena and then win it back, I think? I'm maybe. not sure, maybe. but it's very common that that happens, <laughs> like as soon as a guy drops the strap. Even I, I was reading some statistics last week, actually, for the year 2015, and Every major champion had done over like a tw like over twelve jobs as champion on TV, so it's really it's really relevant at this, this point in time. Um, you said you had a story. Uh, I guess there's some some heat going on right now. Chris Jericho is being uh. raked over the coals for a supposed racism in a comment last night on Monday Night Raw that's catching fire on the internet. I've yet to, to see this or hear of this myself, so maybe you can fill us boys in on. Oh, well, I just down. I, I just heard about it as we got here. Um, I didn't watch Raw last night yet, but um, they did a segment with uh, him and the Usos and uh, New Day, where he was yeah, where he was managing them, and he used a phrase with the Usos referring to them as his back of the bus boys, <laughs> <laughs> which to most people might imply something um, racially sensitive or to do with segregation. But, uh, anybody who's ever been on tour as a wrestler knows that the back of the bus guys are the guys who are up partying the rowdies, yeah. while the front of the bus guys are the ones who are going to bed. Mm -hmm. And several wrestlers have since come to his defense and, and kind of like put that into context for people. But um, there's a big blow up the oversensitivity, which is why I wanted to bring it up because I know how much you love your uh, society being oversensitive. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I just, I just knew we could get fired up here. It boggles my <laughs> mind that we're in a society because. And I, I mentioned this before, wrestling falls in that weird gray area where you can't get away with that stuff because it's too real to people, but they still call it fake. Yeah. If you watch any other form of entertainment, there's racism. Yeah, the villain can be a racist, whatever. Yeah, there's racism, there's drugs, there's sex, there's rape, there's murder. Yeah. But if professional wrestling says anything out of context like that, it's inappropriate and we got to... Somebody's gonna jump on it. And it's ridiculous. I've been watching a lot of late late '80s, early '90s wrestling the last three, four days, and like the things that come out of Bobby Heenan's mouth every thirty seconds. Like if they have to go back in time and remove all those things, there would be no WWE Network from you know everything prior to two thousand four. Yeah, like because we were even watching like a pay per view from '97, and it was like talking to Shinoku and and Pantera and commentary Brian Christopher and. And Jerry Lawler made every oh, Spanish yeah, they, and Japanese uh, yeah. <laughs> stereotypical racial joke they could have made, and, and when I was when I was watching it, I it, it was funny to me. I didn't find it as offensive. Now. Like it was two heels being heels, yeah. and that's how it came across to me. I was like, "Don't really cross the line here." Like, Bam Bam Bigelow went to Tonka feud where they cut his hair and everything, and every promo Bam Bam cut is just throwing every racial native stereotype he could at it. Yeah, no one better than I. They had Bobby Heenan calling uh, commentary for a midget battle royal in WCW. <laughs> and he said it looked like a riot at a daycare center. And then he, then he got shipped for it after that. said, you can't do that. All the midgets are going to ride in. <laughs> like, we're in a world like that now. And that's it, it just, I think, defeats the concept of professional wrestling because as a heel, you're supposed to be as unlikable and yeah. undesirable as possible. Fucking so you're supposed to be offensive. You're supposed to say sure, things that yeah. piss people off, and that good baby face stands up to the heel and writes that wrong. Like that's, yeah. Been the, the, that's the idea. That's, that's been professional idea. wrestling yeah. since the beginning of time. So yeah. why that's any different now that you can't do those things? It's it's un well, is it, well, it's funny because like the three of us will be will be sitting chatting with, about stuff or, or whatnot and. And an idea will pop up, and it'll be like, eh, I don't know if that'll be allowed these days. And it's not necessarily like, oh, that's that's a bad idea. It won't get heat. It's just, eh, people might not react that well these days. So then we always do it somebody, anyway. Somebody might write a letter or, or complain about this or that. So yeah, write me a that. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I love you. I bet you love to get a letter. Say that. Write me a fucking letter. <laughs> I bet you love to get a letter. I'll respond. But wrestling but, gets held accountable this way. Yeah. But oh yeah. When you look at entertainment as a whole, it's probably the most offensive <laughs> it's ever been. When you look at like stand up comedians oh, and, and yeah. music and and some of the movies and stuff that are out there now. Yeah. Uh, we were watching uh, a movie based on Travis School's life the other night, uh, The 40-Year-Old Virgin. And 
<laughs> like, I'm not 40 years old. Well, you're going to get there. You're not far <laughs> off. Um, but they were making all kinds of like racial jokes and sexual jokes, oh, and insane. it was and it was all meant to laugh. Like yeah. there's no like it wasn't offensive to, to be hearing these things. Like it was no. all meant in, in good fun and in the in the name of entertainment. And it, it's allowed everywhere, but wrestling for some reason. Like yeah. or a wrestler could be in character and say something on social media, and a wrestler gets raped, uh, you know over the coals for it. And I just oh, yeah. I don't I don't understand. Yeah, but it. it there's this weird it's like line. people still take it as reality, you know. There's this weird line don't. though too, right? Yeah. It's like you like um, uh, social media. It's like you're hot. Sh you're you're Danny Duggan on your social media. So are you tweeting in character? Or are you out of character? You kind of everything in wrestling. Everything seems seems to kind of blend. I don't think wrestling has found its its place yet within that. Uh, when I when I tweet. I'm just I'm just tweeting for for whatever purpose, but I'm not tweeting in character. You know, if you and I are if you and I are having a match next weekend, other than maybe like a jokey little tweet, I, I'm not going to be like hey, I hate Danny Duggan or whatever. Like you'll still do your. I usual. write that about you every day. But... Yeah, but you actually hate me. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> and I get but, that you know being in the business we're in, we're probably way more laid back just from the environment that we're we're in since we get brought into the business. Yeah. But. There's nothing that ever offends me that something like somebody says like, with these big with these big headlines coming up of all oh, this this racial it, it, none of this ever offends me. I'm like whatever like if that's the way that guy feels. I don't agree with him. I don't think what he said is right, but it's not offending me to the point I'm going to start rioting and protesting. Yeah. And, and I think being in this business, you get a thick skin after a while. You really or do. things like that do. don't bother you. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if like we you know the Hulk Hogan thing was going down, oh he's a racist. Well, if you really think he's a racist, just don't support what Hulk don't Hogan does. Buy a shirt. Don't, don't buy a shirt. It's that, that easy. Doesn't it? yeah. you know what he said is you know was it wrong? Yes, but yeah. just don't support him. Then yeah. it's as simple as that. You don't like something, don't support it. Mm -hmm. It's really really that easy. To wrap up the last portion of our, our mainstream wrestling segment here, I guess you, you you mentioned last night we kind of planted the seeds about a match we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, the possible Brock Lesnar Kevin Owens match. Going into to WrestleMania, we thought, you know, it wasn't possible, but it's looking like it's the direction they're not going in. Let's they probably starts. heard the podcast, heard me say that, and they're like, <laughs> fuck, I Kevin Cannon's on to something. <laughs> they spooked all your ideas. Fox right? suckers, yeah. Yeah, it seems like that could be a direction they're going. Um, I've, apparently, he's been cutting promos on, on, on like, live, like the, you know, the live event promos that they used to cut. Where you know you cut a thirty per second promo about coming to this town or what have you. Yeah, yeah. Like he's been cutting his promos specifically to Brock Lesnar, I guess, and and um, he was featured pretty heavily last night on Raw, apparently. And Brock came down and beat everybody up, but I think he powdered before he could do that. And Kevin seems, Owens always like fucks me up. Like he's from province of Quebec, yeah, but he doesn't really seem like he's got too much of an accent. Like is he? What did he do to? I don't Where know. Himself, himself, you, or like, you, when you listen to him talk for a length of time, yeah. you can kind of hear it a little, a little yeah. bit. The but it's not like listening to like Jacques Rougeau, where he's like, the funny thing about and that, then I went to the fucking star, and you know, it's like, it's not, you know, like the funny thing about that though too is I don't know how old he was, but I remember hearing a story where he said that he learned to speak English by watching Jim Ross. Oh, oh, matches. So he actually, yeah, like, he, speaks he didn't grow, first yeah, he didn't grow up in an English speaking happen. household. He 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 learned it from watching wrestling. Well, then he should sound like he came from Alabama. Talk with one side of his face. Oh my! <laughs> what? <laughs> We're getting so easily offended, Travis. <laughs> there are no words. My words fail me. But back to where we are on this track here. Yeah. So Kevin Owens and Brock Lesnar, how about that? <laughs> well, actually, actually, we were talking before how we don't have an indie idiot of the week, but it looks like we do have an indie idiot of the week. Oh. I got an email that I was checking during that. No kidding. Uh, we've got a green kid from Calgary that was going to you know, do do our Edmonton show uh, yeah. on the tour, but he's been told by his promoter, Kurt Sorok, that he is not allowed to do shows because Sherwood Park is too close to Edmonton, mm -hmm. so he is not allowed to work shows for us. So I, we'll, we'll give Kurt our indie, indie, indie Idiot of the Week for this week for pulling stupid petty politic bullshit yeah. that indie wrestling for young kid. Yeah, young yeah. kid. Like, our, our tour is stacked. We've talked about this before. Uh. Our tour is stacked with, like, top guys from around the world. So good yeah. chance this kid's going to be in the ring with one of these guys. He'll learn something. You know, he's in the locker room. Yeah. yeah. 
He's going to be the least experienced guy on our crew. Good the opportunity. Promoter, is he got a work name? No, yeah, he's the, the Kurtz Rockins name. Him, uh, yeah, I got a, a little birdie told me he was uh, going above and beyond trying to sabotage any opportunity for us to actually go directly into Edmonton on shows because they have a commission there. Yeah. And they're the last place in, in Canada that has one, so you need to be mm -hmm. licensed and all that jazz. So I uh, put out an inquiry to the commission to try to get a show in Edmonton because one of our sponsors there wants to host it at their facility so I was yeah. curious to what the protocol was sure. and it, a little birdie that uh, works in their office told me uh, just a heads up I'm not involved uh, with what's going on but you should probably know that this is happening so it's good to see that stupid wrestling politics are still alive and well in Alberta as we get set for our tour there. The you know, yeah, I, yeah the, my favorite part about that is literally runs that town ten times a year, the same crowd every single month. So what does you coming into town have anything to do with this business? Right. I I worked there for three years, -ish, something like that, and I think this, it was the same crowd every month. And that's always the way it is with these promoters yeah. that do yeah. it. So, Same thing with the promoter here that tries to pull that shit. They've got like their little box that they have, and they like to try to protect their box and make sure none of them, nobody leaves and, and goes anywhere else. And it's silly because they put half the effort that they put into blocking guys from wrestling on other shows and all that bullshit that goes into it. They might actually advance their business and do something well with themselves, but that's not going to happen. And that just furthers my point exactly of why. I, I left Alberta was because there's so many guys there who won't say fuck that noise and and will just do what he says. I I would come out here, I would go other places and stuff like that, so I never had any issue with that. You told me you left there because everyone found out you got a hand job for your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Here, I'm going to move on. Was it a male or female cousin? I never caught here nor there. You were not supposed <laughs> to say anything about that. <laughs> No, but it goes back to promoters yeah. being selfish in the sense that they, they don't have the boys' best interests at heart. This kid is fresh out of training. Yeah, he would be by far the least experienced guy on our show by a landslide because he's on a show with top international talent from anywhere. So we're throwing him a bone, giving him an opportunity to to work and be in a locker room full of guys that can advance his career. Yeah, and this guy's saying, no, nope, you'll just keep on doing your one show a month here and you'll get better at the pace I decide you get better at because I want to control your progress and it's just such an ass backwards yeah, attitude and one of the reasons I started CWE in the first place because a lot of promoters here had that same mentality and yes as a promoter and, and me being a promoter contest you do have to protect your, your best interests Yeah. But, but if I was in his situation uh, the promoter there in Edmonton that kid wrestling on my show uh, three hours from where he lives is likely not going to put an extra dollar in my pocket He's, he's getting an opportunity to, to work on a show that's going to enhance and, and better his career more so than it's going to benefit us yeah. having him. So just selfish bullshit behavior. And, and indie wrestlers at home that are in these situations, get your head out of your ass, grow a set of balls, and don't let promoters do these things to you. Yeah, they'll make you sign a contract. <laughs> say, say you can't go work for anyone else, but I'm only going to book you twice a year. Right? Like, and if you go somewhere else, I'll see you. And see, here's the thing, too. I've seen that before. Is, oh, I bet. If this is the case, he's working twice a month at best. At best. Probably 20 shows a year. He moved here from another side of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, to train and then and work and get better. And I, I asked around about him yesterday, and I was told that he has potential. And, like, he's a really good kid, and he's got potential. But yeah. you're not going to realize any potential working twice a month. Where do you move from? Um, Australia. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. Oh, solid. Yeah, so we had that we talked about that last he, week as well with Nathan with, Jones. <laughs> no. Guys <laughs> no. doing the same thing. Like these promoters saying, no, I don't want you wrestling anywhere else. You just wrestle here. I hate to break it to, to the wrestlers on the independent level, especially in Canada. None of us as an individual are drawing the house. No. <laughs> so <laughs> so when you're doing this thing, it's, it's not like, okay, well, Kevin, if you go wrestle for that show down the street, you're going to draw them an extra 100 people and might put me out of business. Cause it's, it's not going to happen no, like that. Not, <laughs> and, but that's the attitude. I'd well. be offended by that statement if I was you. Yeah, hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that's that's the attitude these guys have, and it's, it's yeah. ridiculous. Instead of I, I want sense. I want my guys wrestling on as many shows as they can because yeah. the more ring time they get, the better they're going to be. And hey, if they go wrestle on another show, maybe they'll draw some fans from that show to come check out ours because they, you know, really enjoyed that guy's work and they want to see him wrestle again. Mm -hmm. Like it's just such an ass backwards business where it's like, oh, that's my toy, you can't play with it. Yeah. Okay. You know, your toy's gonna get awful rusty and be in the bargain bin in no time because it's not gonna be getting any use. 
So on that note, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to indulge into the long career of the young Todd Bullet. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. It's Coco Bill! <laughs> In one click with MusclesByMyers.com, we have sports supplements, vitamins and minerals for all lifestyles and levels of fitness. And call or email for free one-on-one -on -one guidance. Smart buyers shop at Myers and MusclesByMyers.com. long commercial break of Kevin Cannon unleashing lots of offensive words that we couldn't put on the podcast. Slurs, I call them. Slurs. Just, or <laughs> everyday words. Everyday words, yeah. That's conversation. Those, are, Collins, those yeah. are good words. They're good words. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it's no wonder you and Bob Collins get along yeah, so great. Know. And, and I said, you know, I'm not going to repeat the words here. But uh, yeah, uh, unless, unless, unless they slip out, unless they slip out, or the, the context is appropriate. But <laughs> I've been using these words for. You know, close to four decades. I'm not going to change. See, I, my I tell Travis that all the time because some of the words you use, like I use this terms of affection towards Travis. And he's like, Those words are really offensive. <laughs> yeah, they're politically incorrect. I'm like, yeah, but that's what you are. So just, yeah. just, just embrace it. It's okay. Yeah. Like I don't mean it in a hateful way. <laughs> no. That's just the way some of us were brought up. Oh, yeah. That's the way it is. And I've still cleaned it up from the generations before me. Like, have you listened to my mom or my grandma talk? I'm, I'm the Pope. Yeah, <laughs> I love your mom and your dad. Oh, yeah, yeah. solid. Well, <laughs> you didn't catch a full conversation. Yeah, yeah, those conversations are best. Like those yeah. old generations. Oh yeah, they're they're solid. I had a beer with your grandma. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you did. I didn't get invited. You were on out tour. Speaking of the old generation, we're going to talk about Todd Bullitt. He has to be one of the longest active wrestlers in Winnipeg, I'd say, at this point. Nineteen ninety-two. Aside from so old. Well, I'm making I you I... sound distinguished. 24 Thank years. You. 24 years in the business. How many other guys are still working? Like Bobby Jay broke in around your time. Bobby Collins. Yeah. Is there, you know, Furpo? Yeah. Is there anybody else that's still working from? from well, like... Broda, if he's still alive. <laughs> but today. he doesn't wrestle in matches. Yeah, he does. No, he, he does. does. No, he, does. <laughs> he wrestled on a match on that show we worked. No, he doesn't. Yeah, he did. He wrestled. Yeah. Um, so there's, not, there's not too many guys left that would have the insight you do that are still active today. So I'm pretty it's excited. a small handful of guys. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that you know is a pat on the back or what the hell are you doing, man. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> a little bit of both. It's, it's long for the business. They it definitely have to live is. and breathe and live and die the, the business. Of course. Sometimes it's hard to let go. It, it really is, and that's that's why so many people have a hard time leaving the business when it is their time. Um, but you're still working great like there's no there's no slowing down for yourself a lot of guys that have been working for 25 30 years you're like oh man they gotta 
they got to get out of here. But you still go out there and you bust your ass, you get over, you've got a, a character and personality that connects with the audience. And, and one thing I will say is, I've, you know, since you've been back the last year, I see you work with, with a lot of different guys, and you're not one of those you know, veterans that are like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want to do that. You still go out there and you're, you're trying to stay current with the stuff that's going on there, and that's very commendable because so many guys don't do that, and those are the guys that you're like, man, when's that guy going to go away? <laughs> so, you know, you're always going to have a standing standing welcome when you've got that kind of work ethic. Let's go back to the, when it all began. You started in 1992. Yeah, it was in June of 1992. started with uh, Tony Candelo's uh, wrestling camp. Put me in there. How, how did you find Tony? Like, cause this, uh, back then it was a little bit harder to get into the business. Uh, mm -hmm. Back then, WFWA was on CKY TV, and he started running ads that he was opening a wrestling camp. He had his phone number, so I gave him a call. Met him down at uh, some mall somewhere, just had a sandwich with him and talked. And You paid for that sandwich, didn't you? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Tony. Tony doesn't pay for nothing. <laughs> And uh, he hooked me up with uh, where to go and what time to be there and started his camp. Was this when he was training people out of his basement? Uh, it was a basement of a hair salon on Court <laughs> So the padding wasn't uh, necessarily the softest to be learning um, the team The padding? I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> what, it, what it was, was it was a makeshift ring built in this basement. It had two of the ropes were cemented into the wall and two ring posts. It was sleeping bags on the floor with canvas on a cement floor. That's that's where I learned to take Where he probably made guys sleep when they're in town from somewhere else in Canada. Oh, he showed me Roddy Piper's blood that was on that night. <laughs> that's, a, that's a story. So was Tony your actual trainer when you started training with him, or did you have somebody else doing the, the training at the time? No, the, Tony did a lot of the training. Um, Bulldog Bob Brown was there. He was helping out also. Uh, Don Callis, the natural, he helped out. Uh, and guys, guys that would come and go through there, uh, Stan Saxon, Brother Midnight, uh, Bobby J, Brian Jewell. Was the Chicago, uh, Chicago Bowl, was he in there? Pinsky. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he came and went a little bit. Nice. Um, <laughs> was there any notable guys that were training with you at the time that would end up going on to wrestle? Uh, other than other than Callis and you know maybe Chi Chi Cruz a little bit down in the states and stuff. They were actually in your training class or no no they they were they would come okay. and work out with us. Was there anybody that was training with you that was breaking in at the same time? Uh, Dean Ducharme. Oh, Mr. Uh, Black. Yeah, Black. Dean Ducharme and a guy named uh, Crazy Wolf Chris Wall. Okay. Yeah, n nobody ever told him it was a work. That fucking <laughs> guy was a. <laughs> Surprised he didn't end up heavyweight champion somewhere in town. Oh my God! Um, debunk a myth for me about Tony and his training. Does, does Tony know his stuff when it comes down to the fundamentals of wrestling? Because in this day and age, if you wrestle on a show for Tony and hey Tony, how was that match? Oh, it's fucking great. Meanwhile, it's the fucking worst match the business has ever produced. Like he's completely out of touch. So what a good match is in today. It's either he's not watching, he doesn't care, or he just is not fucking. What's going on? Well, I, I think in, in today's world, he. he He's not in touch with what works and what doesn't right, anymore. Okay. Tony's still in 1972, and and no knock against Tony. I, I love the guy, and uh, I've never met anybody that didn't like Tony. No, but uh, as a trainer, he was okay. He was in there smoking his cigarettes and giving his two cents <laughs> while everybody else did the work. Good for your cardio. And yeah, learning to take bumps. Yeah, I had uh, one time we were working on headlocks. Uh, Bob Brown gets in the ring with me and says, "Here, put me in headlocks." You know, I'm working it a little bit. He pulls his head out, well, what the fuck was that? So I said, well, you know, I'm trying to do a headlock. He says, yeah, fuck, I'll show you a fucking headlock. He squeezes my head so hard I can hear my skull cracking. <laughs> there, that's how you do a fucking headlock. <laughs> but uh, it, it was tough back then because smaller guys weren't taken seriously. And I mean, you can see I'm, I'm not the biggest guy in the world. So it, they had that mentality where, you know, let's beat up, beat up the new kids and eventually they won't come back. But I kept coming back, and eventually, you know, then things chilled out a little bit. And I had, uh, Bobby J had told me years later that he apologized for all these guys that were kicking the shit out of me in the basement for like two months straight. And he said he didn't want to do it, but Bob Brown was telling me you have to do it. This is the way it is. This is the way you got to break him in. You know, he's, he, we got to find out if he's got what it takes kind of thing. I had uh, Chi Chi Cruz chop me until my chest bled. Uh, natural, give me a belly-to-back suplex on the cement that ended up with a concussion. 
Uh, just things like that. Fix it. What happen all the time. Jeez. Now, Don Callis, he's he and Amy brought up a lot due to his, his time here in Winnipeg. Um, what was your what was your impression of Don at the time? Did you get along with him, or did he kind of give you the elitist attitude that many others have claimed <laughs> he had given them over the years during his time here? Don definitely rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. He was always nice to me, always offered me advice, you know, critiqued my matches, told me, you know, what I should do, what I shouldn't do, things like that. But yeah, he definitely rubbed people the wrong way. I know when he had taken over Tony's TV, a lot of people felt that he was putting himself in the main place and everybody else got pushed to the side. So I think that's that was a lot of it. And I guess it worked out for him because he used that valuable time to kind of prepare himself and get himself ready for bigger opportunity, which he did get. So yep. they do say sometimes in this business you have to be selfish to get ahead, and that may be one of those situations where it worked out for him. Yep. Um, Tony Candelo, he's, he's somebody that everybody's got a story of. Um, he's, if you've met Tony, even for five minutes, you'll have a memory or an impression of Candelo. Uh, what, are, what are some of your remember, or some of your memories or, or crazy stories of working with Tony and, and his wild, crazy behavior? Well, one in, one in particular, we had done a show somewhere, and so he paid everybody with a check. And, uh, <laughs> no, this is Tony. So, <laughs> so I, I take the check to the bank, and of course, check box, the check's no problem. Yeah. So, Tony was still running a hair salon out in Pemina Highway somewhere. So, so I stopped by and I said, Tony, that, uh, that check you wrote is no good. Fucking bounce at the bank. He says, I ah, just bring the fucking check in here. I'll give you the money. So I reach in my pocket and pull the check. Said, yeah, I got the check right here, Tony. Looks at me and says, hey, you fucking stiff. Pull, pull some money out of the till and hands it to me. <laughs> was that the only time you were stiffed by Tony Candelo? That was the only time Tony ever stiffed. Well, that's not too bad. I've heard of... Maybe. I've heard a few more. But <laughs> if he can, if he can you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. Sometimes. Yeah, he definitely could. Who were some of the guys you were working with uh, in your first year for Tony? Uh, well, like I like I mentioned, um, Chichi Cruz is there, Stan Saxon, Bobby J, Brian Jewell, um, Dave Pinsky was there for a while. Uh, Joe Aiello was doing his announcing at the time, so I, I still keep in touch with Joe. We still talk now and again. Um, the natural, um, Dean Ducharme and, and the other kid that was training with us. That was, uh, Bruiser Baskin also, and Marty Goldstein was there once in a while. Were you good buddies with Marty back then? Oh, uh, we, we, we kind of talked back then. We're a lot better friends now, and we've got a lot of stories we can share now, so. You mean him, because once he starts talking, you're not getting any ears in. Well, I, last time I was with Marty, I said hello to him, and I spent an hour talking. <laughs> Uh, I kind of want to touch more. I, I did have here in my notes about being a smaller wrestler at the time, and as you list guys on that crew, they're all pretty big boys. Yeah. So once your training was complete, how did you kind of fit in with that crew, and how did you kind of find your own place? Because not only are you, you know, the green guy on the crew, you're the smallest guy on the crew. So what did that mean for you, in, in terms of direction and how you were used on the shows, how you were treated by the other guys in matches? Uh, I didn't get treated very well by the bigger guys and the veteran guys. They they kind of pushed the. Newer guys aside, um, Dean Ducharme, like I said, I trained with him. He was a bigger guy, so they they gave him a little more of the rub. Me, I got I got stuck to curtain jerker for most of the shows. So, but it, it was a chance to learn. So, is there anyone specific you enjoyed working with at that time that was maybe a little easier to work with and more beneficial to your development? Uh, actually, the the guy who's conspicuous by his absence, I worked with. Furpo an awful lot back then. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, he's a smaller guy as well. So yeah. You guys were the, the junior heavyweight showcase of the show. <laughs> lots, of, lots of Hurricane Ranas and head scissor takeovers. Oh, yeah, sure. Plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't uh, too long after that. It was 1993. You, you jumped over to the, the upstart River City Wrestling Crew. Is that because of how you were being treated working for Tony and just wanted a fresh scene and a fresh start? Um, at that time... Uh, Callis had taken over Tony's TV, and he was he had a small group of guys he wanted to use, and nobody else was getting booked. So I, I didn't know where to go from there. I had met uh, Robbie Royce through Tony, and I was talking to him on the phone one day, and he says, why don't you come down and talk to this guy, Doug McCall. He runs River City Wrestling. Maybe he'll give you a spot there. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I ended up talking to Doug, and he says, yeah, sure, come on down. We'll give you a spot here. We'll find you something to do. So I ended up working there with uh, you know, Mike Phillips, Sergeant Steele, an awful lot in the beginning, which was memorable. <laughs> Any specific reason? 
Oh, he did. He says, I got one word for you, kid. And I said, yeah, I know, sell. <laughs> so, so you came in as a baby face? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, came in as a baby face. And uh, yeah, he beat me up for a while. And uh, when, when he could see that, you know, I wasn't a, a bad guy and I didn't have a chip on my shoulder, didn't have a bad attitude, was willing to do whatever needed to be done, then we got along pretty good what, after that. Was, was Wayne promoting that original 93 crew or was that McCall or was McCall booking? Uh, it was, I think it was uh, Doug McCall, uh, Wayne did the announcing and McCall and Pinsky, I believe. They were like partners, were they not? Yeah, yeah, they okay. were more partners. So you were there as the company started and then yeah. as all the partnerships started to explode? Yeah. All right, let's get into some of that because I imagine there had to be some fun locker room environments well, at there, that time. There was one show in particular uh, that uh, Wayne was up announcing whatever the match was and Doug was down in the basement supposed to be directing you know, the matches out to it. But, I mean, Doug was downstairs singing and dancing or doing something. <laughs> and uh, Wayne had come downstairs, you know, and completely lost it. You know how Wayne is when he yells his hair flaps around and shit like that. <laughs> Flipping out on him about how he was making him look like a fucking idiot and this, that, and everything. And I think that, to me, that looked like the beginning of the end right there. I, I love when people get upset about small local wrestling shows. Like yeah. Where they're ready to throw fists. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it got kind of ugly and it, it didn't get any better. So right so what ended up happening that it caused the final split and how did that affect the crew? Because Wayne kept running after they all split, yeah. did not? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the guys that were friends with Doug didn't work for Wayne after that. Um, they just... They all kind of left, and there was a, a newer crew of guys that it was, you know, coming up, like myself, Bobby Collins, uh, guys like that. You know, we stuck around because this was our only, our only venue to work right now. So, was there like a, an actual meeting, like, hey, we're no longer working together, uh, we're gonna go ahead without Doug and, and Pinsky, or was it just? Yeah, something? Wayne. Wayne had a little meeting with the crew that was left, and said that they would no longer be there, and basically, I'm running the show, and this is the way it is. Who took over as Booker after Doug left? Um, I believe Vance Nevada did. Oh, beginning of the Vance Nevada era. Yeah. So you were there right from the beginning of Vance's career then. Yeah. He, he started in 1993. Uh, he's, he's one of the most controversial figures, I would say, in the history of Canadian independent wrestling because he's worked so many territories. People will either love Vance Nevada or they fucking hate Vance Nevada. It's <laughs> one side or the other. He's just one of those pulverizing figures in Canadian wrestling that somebody, you know, has they have an opinion on him one way or the other. What was some of your thoughts of Vance breaking into the business and and him going from a young kid starting in the same locker room as you to, to where he's at now? Uh, in the beginning, I thought he spent a lot of time putting himself over at the expense of everybody else. While he was booking? Yeah. Seems to be a trend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I, I got the Just, so just at the beginning? Yeah, so I'm a champion now. <laughs> but uh, I, it kind of cooled off a little bit, I think. He got a little bit of heat from it, and it kind of backed away from doing it. Was there any, uh, like, yourself and Bobby Collins were young guys on the crew, but Vance was being, you know, he was very young at the time, too, like 16, yep. 17 years old. Yeah, he old. was a young kid. How, how was he handling that locker room? Because there had to be some veterans left, I imagine, that he was now in charge of. And I remember when I was a young booker at 17, 18, 19 years old, like, it can be intimidating having some of these guys that have been in the business you know, 10, 15 years that you have to go up to and say, hey, this is what I want from you tonight. Yeah, I think you got a lot of argument from a lot of people. It was like, okay, this is what we want to do tonight. And someone said, well, no, we're not doing that. We're going to do it like this instead. And he just kind of, oh, okay, well, we'll do it that way then. Did so you personally get along with Vance? Myself? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have any problems with Vance. Did you work a lot with him in the ring around that time? Yeah, yeah, we, we had some matches back then. Nothing spectacular, but yeah, we, we worked each other. Did you question, Travis? I was just going to ask him if, uh, if, uh, uh, if Vance, yeah, we kind of went over it anyway, but I was just going to say, if did Vance uh, kind of go with what the veteran said, or did he stick to his ground? Because obviously everyone has their opinion of how he, uh, how he is politically. Was he someone who, nope, this is what I was told we're doing, this is what we're doing, or was he more, okay, fine, they're... You know. Well, then, uh, like, I, like I just mentioned, uh, you know, he would say, this is the way we want to do it. And someone would say, no, we're doing it like this instead. And then he would kind of go along with it. And then I think he was stooging to Wayne. And then <laughs> Wayne got involved in it. And it just turned into a big fucking schmoz. Yeah, was there any fallout from Doug leaving River City Wrestling? 
Was there any, did he come back at all? I remember you mentioning briefly in the hallway there was a time that him and Wayne got very heated at a show due to their, their falling out in the partnership. Was that while Wayne was still running River City or was that more so in the, the CWF days? Uh, that was more in the CWF days. I think, uh, I'm not sure if Wayne was still running shows or not, but uh, there was a, uh, Ernie Todd was running a show and I think Wayne had showed up, you know, just to, you know, I'm a fan, you can't stop me from coming kind of thing. And it needled them pretty good. And the way it was going to go down was somebody was trying to coax Wayne into the locker room <laughs> to come and say hi to the boys and let's just say there was something waiting for him. And lucky for him he didn't show up. Oh, wow. So they were going to take care of business. That was McCall or just like a couple guys in general? No, there, there was more than a couple of guys. <laughs> <laughs> and what was this heat that, that was causing that big of a stir? No, I don't know the whole story on that one. I just knew that they hated each other. Okay, so you, you did work with Wayne and then you did work with Ernie. Was that right when Ernie got into the business in 95 or did you come shortly after he got involved? Yeah, I think a lot of people were tired with the direction Wayne was going in. And um, Bobby Collins actually started the CWF. And... He ended up meeting up with Ernie Todd, and Ernie Todd partnered with him, and then, of course, Was it advanced that brought Ernie into the business? It, it could have been, but, I mean, uh, Bobby had met Ernie in this, during this time. Okay. I don't know how they met, but... So he got involved in the business, so were you still working with Wayne when he started up and you decided yeah. to make the jump? Yep. Please tell me there's a good parting way story with you and Wayne, because very few people leave <laughs> civilly with Wayne. It's either you're fired or you quit and you get called a coward. Yeah, yeah, we went through some of that. <laughs> <laughs> Any specific high spots from that, that time? I think you summed it up right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like I've heard it a time or two. May yeah. even have been involved in it a time or two. So let's uh, let's hear some of your initial thoughts on, on Ernie Todd getting into business, because he's another guy that people uh, have a very strong opinion of one way or another. Uh, you were there from the beginning of Ernie getting involved in the business. What was uh, a green Ernie Todd like in 1995? Uh, actually, the, when I first met Ernie, I, I liked him. I, I thought he was, a, he was a, a guy who wasn't a young kid. I thought he had some ideas for direction, and he had money he wanted to invest and things like that. And I thought, well, you know, this could be good for the business. And how'd that work out? Where is he today? <laughs> the boys always it's getting me kicked off shows. Yeah, the boys always like guys who uh, who have money to spend. So yeah. <laughs> anytime you hear about somebody having money to spend, or yeah, money. but I mean, with, with Ernie, Ernie's like Wayne. I never had any major heat with him or anything. I just didn't like the direction they were doing with things. Um, at, at one point, Ernie had gotten a pilot TV deal with APTN TV or whatever. So when I had talked originally talked to him about it, I you know I had some ideas. You know, here's you know maybe something you could do on your show or whatever. He did no, 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 we're not doing that, and because they had uh, Bobby Collins and the referee Angus had this little feud thing going or whatever during uh, during the house shows, and it, it was funny. It was getting a good pop out of the crowd. I said, you know, play a little bit of that out. You know, like make your show entertaining, not not just wrestling. And he said, no, no, we're not gonna do that. And, end up showing like a 45 minute Robbie Royce versus somebody else match and I'm like well there's your hour it's, it's gone <laughs> and you showcase two people right. I don't know knock against those two guys but I mean you haven't showed anybody you gotta build a brand yeah so Ernie as time went on the business obviously his ego grew with the time he put in were you around for that transition of him kind of being young to the business and excited to be on board to becoming kind of more controlling about what he wanted to do and how he wanted it done Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, he, he definitely uh, did a 360 or a 180, whatever you want to call it on that one, where he went from trying to learn to becoming now I know everything and nobody else knows anything. Do you remember like a definite moment in time where you were like, something's changed here, this is going to be changing for the long haul? Yeah, I, I think that there was, he had a pretty loyal group of guys working for him, and there was a handful of guys that didn't like the direction. So they went off on their own and started, I think it was called Power Pro Wrestling or Correct. something. Yeah. And, you know, there, there was the big rivalry because, you know, here the venue was right across the street on the same night and guys from Power Pro were throwing free tickets and, you know, in the other venue here, come to our show instead or whatever. <laughs> it, it, it built up some big heat or whatever. But eventually Ernie Todd came to an agreement with, with those guys. You know, you guys can come back and whatever. So the guys that had stayed loyal to Ernie didn't like that because it's like, hey, you know, we've been loyal to you. Now you're letting these guys come back for like no repercussions. 
and uh, Steve Stryker, he made him the booker, and that was like, it, it literally set up the locker room. It's like, fuck, you know, this guy left, and now we have to listen to him? You know, after we stayed loyal to you, and mentioned in Furpo before, he just lost it on him in the locker room. They almost, you know, got into a fist fight. Furpo, and who, sorry? Steve Stryker. Stryker. Oh, really? Stryker and Furpo almost got into a fight? Yeah. And what brought that on? Just the fact that Furpo wasn't going to listen to him. It was a matter of like, hey, you guys left. We stuck around and, you know, you held the fort, and now you guys come back and now you're going to be in charge, and all these guys are getting put over, and the guys who stayed loyal, you know, got shuffled to the bottom of the deck hole. So who were some of the guys that left and some of the guys that stayed? Um, I think it was like Vance left, Robbie left, Steve Stryker left, um, Mike Myers. I'm trying to think of the other guys. I can't think of who they all were, though. So when Stryker came back, was was it just resentment because he had left, or was he just not universally respected by the crew, and, and is that part of why the guys didn't want to listen? Well, I, I think, like I said, because we had held the fort, and he left, so I think he lost respect to the guys that had stuck around and, and stayed. So it was like a definite line in the sand in the locker room. Yeah. Uh, how did Ernie respond to that? Is that where kind of the change in him came? Yeah, in, in a nutshell, I said, suck it up or there's a door. Okay, and at the time, there was nowhere else to wrestle. Yeah. Because Tony really wasn't running too much at the time, I, no. I don't think. No, there wasn't a lot of places to go. I can't remember which guys it were, but I know guys... There was a, a handful of guys that just stopped coming, or they would come sporadically. How many times did you have to put over Ernie Todd or Iron Man? <laughs> um, a few. <laughs> <laughs> another all, another all, trend. Although I, I do remember wrestling him on one particular show, and I went to give him a nut shot, but little did I know he's wearing boxer shorts and his you know, 45-year-old nuts are hanging down to his knees. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I nut shot at him and actually dropped him to his knees. <laughs> I was working with Ernie. Uh, I, I worked with Ernie a lot when I broke in on tour, um, for better or worse of my career. It was an experience uh, nonetheless. Uh, you had been wrestling a couple, you know, in 95, 96. You've been wrestling three, four, five years. Now you've got Ernie, who's brand new to the business, yep. athletically limited, um, to say the <coughs> least. Uh, but he had great triceps. He did have great triceps. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't like Ernie either. No, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so you know, you're, you're, you know, you've, you've put time in the business. You paid your dues. You've worked really hard. Uh, you know, you've put your time having matches for five years in the business. Now you're working with Ernie, who's green as a wrestler, but your boss. Yep. So, what was that experience like? Did you feel pressure to, to have to cater to what he wanted to do, or did he let you lead the matches and and make him look the best you could possibly make him look? No, I had to make him look the best he could possibly look. <laughs> <laughs> but was it very much like what he wanted to do, or were you able to kind of guide and be the best? No, it's, it's what he wanted to do. Good. <laughs> so yeah, make him look the best he could within his own parameters. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, you would stop working for Ernie and then go back working for Wayne. What was the, uh, the nail in the coffin for you to kind of take some time away from the CWF and go back to Wayne? Who you just uh, I think it, prior? It, it was just a matter that the guys didn't like the direction Ernie was going in. And myself and a few other guys had had enough, and it was time to go. So uh, Wayne got a hold of me about coming back to River City and book, uh, being the booker out there. So I said, okay, you know, I met up with him somewhere, so we had a little meeting or whatever, and I said, okay, well, you know, this is kind of the direction I'm thinking of, and, you know, he was all hot. Oh, yeah, these are all great ideas, everything. And everything's a great idea until you actually get in there and write it on a piece of paper, and then you go, well, I don't really like that idea. <laughs> So we did that for a while, and then it got to the point where uh, I couldn't take the direction that he was going anymore. I don't know if you remember a, a kid that used to wrestle, Jaron Rose. The cycle banger. Yeah. yeah sure well, he, he, he came to a show one day, and he says, oh, my girlfriend's going to be my valet tonight. I said, oh, is, is that right? I said, who booked that? And he said, well, no, I, you know, she's, gonna, she's a good-looking girl. You know, she's going to be my valet. So I laid his girlfriend's like 14 years old, never even seen a wrestling ring, never mind being beside one or in one. So I told Wayne, I said, like, this, this is... This had to be around 2002, 2003, right? It could have been, yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe a little earlier. Okay. But, uh, yeah, so he went and told Wayne, and he said, oh, Wayne says she could be on the show. So I went to see Wayne, I said, Wayne, this is ridiculous. Like, she's 14 years old. She doesn't belong anywhere near a ring. 
well, you know, it might be good for the business, and uh, that was that was kind of the straw that you know I'd had enough of what was going. That on That was there. the year that he had like six or seven sixteen-year-old valets, was it not? Like that that caused quite the stir. Yeah, and uh, I had I had showed up one night to book a show, and there was a handful of guys, Madman Muir and Louis the Love, whatever his name was, Hendrickson, and a couple of other guys. They didn't like the way I was booking the show. So they decided they're going to sit out the show. So rather than just you know sitting in the back or going home, you know they're gonna, they're sat in the third row and watch the show. <laughs> it's like holy Christ! I remember at that like time sitting kids at a date. It, it really was, and I, and I booked for Wayne very early on, and I I remember it being extremely frustrating because it didn't matter what you put together and how good it was or how much somebody was getting over. He had his guys that he like pushed, yep. who were usually untrained, very limited, and you couldn't do a whole lot with. Um, but um, Wayne is very big on who gets the yay and who gets the boo, not necessarily them being authentically over and, and having talent to carry an angle. So if you weren't pushing the right guys, um, or his guys that were no. homegrown by River City Wrestling, which usually meant weren't trained at all, um, over you know guys that were really good that you were bringing in from elsewhere to try to help build his product and ultimately make him some money, mm. you were going up you know Shit's Creek without a paddle, and it was, it was very frustrating doing that. And I remember where, uh, actually... Around that time, that year sit out. I think me and you had a little bit of heat because of that. Cause I just started wrestling. I was a couple years in, and or a couple, sorry, a couple months in maybe of wrestling matches. I wasn't ready to be wrestling yet, um, but I was scheduled to wrestle Muir on a show. And from what I recall, um, that was around the time they sat out because I guess they switched the the book to you or something like yep. that. And you know, Muir was always very nice to me at that time. I never had any heat with with Eli. And you know he was telling me it was bullshit. We're supposed to be wrestling this match. They're not. So like, don't don't do it. And I remember going to Wayne. You know, after talking to Eli and he's, and and saying, well, you know, Eli really wants to do his match. He said we're supposed to do it. And you thought I was going behind your back. And looking back at the time, I was not knowing any better. Just being a young naive kid, just going with the flow of what I thought was the the right thing to do. So I remember I ended up having heat with you when you first started taking over the book. You thought I was trying to <laughs> go behind my go back. behind your back. So I ended up wrestling you and you ended up stretching me a little bit just to, to kind of prove a point. <laughs> so, do you remember that match? Uh, vaguely. Yeah. I remember the situation, the match, I don't really remember. Yeah, um, nobody else does either, but I, I, I remember <laughs> Thank, God. Thank God. But yeah, it was very early on in my career and that was like a lesson I learned. Like, and you, were, you weren't uh, you didn't stretching in the sense that you were rough with me or beat me up or anything bad, but I could tell that you were, weren't happy and after it was, it was a lesson for me to learn that, oh, maybe I, I shouldn't have done that. I just didn't, you know, I was so young, I was 15, 16 years old, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know any better and that was like kind of my first taste of wrestling politics at such a small level, just realizing, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't have went and done that, even though this guy's my friend and that's what he asked me to do because it wasn't the, the professional thing to do, but that kind of thing would go on all the time in River City Wrestling when I was booking. Mm -hmm. So I got I got a taste of my own medicine dealing with that with tons of guys because you'd book the show and you know a Jaron Rose or a, somebody would go to Wayne and be like, no, no, I really want to do this. I want to I want to wrestle that guy or yeah. I want to bring this guy to the ring with me. Like that's horrible for the business. We're not doing that. But yep. just, oh, I think we should give it a try. <laughs> and here you go, rewriting your show, knowing what you're putting in front of the people isn't what's best for business. And yeah. What was your ultimate uh, nail in the coffin for you to stop booking for Wayne at that time? Was there another blowout? No, I, th I think that was right about the time, you know, when, when uh, with the 14-year-old girls beside the ring and, uh, you know, guys didn't like the way I booked, so they'd go to him and then he'd come to me and it was like, well, am I the booker or am I just here to, you know, write shit on paper that everybody else wants to do or whatever. <laughs> so I, 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 I told them, I said, you know, I don't want to do it anymore. And then it, we got into the, well, you're never really a booker. All you did was write stuff on paper as well. It wasn't a booker because you didn't let me do anything. No. And when you give somebody the book, like, yes, when it's your money as a promoter, you want to uh, pass along your vision. Like, this is what I envision happening with my company. This is how I'd like my money spent. But you're hiring someone to book it and put it all together in the best way possible. Um, he would never do that. <laughs> but no. He would hire a guy as a booker and they'd be just that. No, no, here's my ideas. I just want you to kind of jot it down. You're almost an assistant. Yeah, I'm, I'm like a secretary. Yeah. Of, exactly. Of and, and you can't do that. When you give somebody the book, 
is because you trust their experience, you trust their vision, and their abilities to put forth the best show for you. So you can't be cutting your legs out from under them, or you're never going to get the product you want. And you're going to have a guy that's not willing to put in the effort he's capable of putting in for you if you don't give him that faith. Yep. Um, Wait, another, I think, I, I've said this before, like, and, and everyone's been on and off with Wayne for years, and I, I really believe a big part of him ran shows just for that drama and bullshit. Like, he really thrived on all the stuff that went on behind the scenes with the guys fighting and politicking and firing Makes guys and, and throw scenes over, because there was plenty of times I would see him take things that should have been a benefit to his company, but no, no, we're not going to do it in effort for something that was clearly yeah. bad. So I think it was more so just, you know, it was, it was play time for him. It was a hobby for him. He's, he stated many times he you know, wasn't running wrestling shows to make money. It was just for fun and yep. give guys opportunities. These underdogs that weren't getting opportunities anywhere else and these were underdogs that didn't deserve opportunities yep. anywhere else because they weren't putting in the work to get booked anywhere else. Yep. But they were his team and he went to, to bat with them every week and and ultimately, it, it caused the chaos in Winnipeg wrestling for a long time. That's finally kind of weeded itself out as we're going into 2016. Yeah. When you look around now, that mentality is very limited. Yeah. Everybody, for the most part, can get in the ring and go, which is really good. So it's taken about 25 years, but we finally have reversed the cycle. <laughs> yeah. And we're putting forth good wrestling shows. Getting back to the way it should have been. So was that your last stint in Winnipeg was for Wayne before you relocated to the States? Yeah. Yeah, that that's where I pretty much call it quits. So you're like, fuck this it was guy actually, the country. Actually, just before I left, uh, Easy Rider had just he was starting up uh, Ringmasters. Ringmasters, mm -hmm. and I was supposed to be a part of that. And yeah. with me moving, it was just it wasn't gonna work. So, well, you didn't miss much. <laughs> I don't think. I don't <laughs> from, think. From I don't what I hear, <laughs> I don't think they lasted too long after you left. So. Yeah, I didn't see it, but I've heard plenty of stories. So. <laughs> And, and mentioned the promoters. I know I had said this to you earlier, and uh, I had the wild man was over at my place for New Year's, and we were laughing, saying, back in the day when you were a young skinny kid just starting out, we said, uh, don't take this Doug and kid seriously. You get your own life. <laughs> now everybody's fucking working for you. <laughs> I remember when I was 14 years old refereeing on shows. I was a mouthy little kid, believe it or not. I had a lot to say. Oh, really? And uh, I remember Rob Stardom telling me that very specifically. He's like, oh, we don't care, kid. We know you're never going to be a wrestler. And I'm the guy that books him now. So <laughs> that's funny kind of how that works. Um, you did go down to the States. Did you work for any companies down there? Or did you kind of just take some time off? And uh, I, I worked two shows the entire time I was there for 12 years. Oh, wow. Uh, Worked for a kid. Most people's careers don't last that long. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I worked for a kid as a Brian something. I can't remember what his name is, but but he ran some little Ricky date promotion. And uh, the, when it came to booking and stuff, I mean, the Louis Hendrickson was a fucking genius compared to this guy. <laughs> you know, he he's, he's got some skinny kid. He wanted me to wrestle, and uh, the kid had like two matches in. He says, I want you to put him over in 30 seconds. <laughs> so I said, well, he's not going to learn much then. I said, you know, like, let me work with him for a little while, and then, you know, he, maybe he's going to learn something. Nope, this is the way I want to do it. Okay, well, whatever you want to do. Uh, then the show's over. It's like, you know, well, where's, where's the payoff? He said, well, I don't pay my guys. I said, well, I don't work for free. <laughs> so so I, I worked two shows for him, and that was the end of that. <laughs> you mentioned Louis Henderson. You have, did you have any run-ins with Louis when you were booking for River City? No, oh, he was a nightmare to to be even be around. <laughs> like smell wise, or just <laughs> well, he didn't take a bath. I don't think he had any teeth. <laughs> um, I mean, he was Lou, uh, Wayne's lackey. That's all he was. Yeah, that's the only reason he was ever in the business. Was he one of the guys that would politic against your booking? Oh, uh, he was one of the worst for me at the time. <laughs> show by show basis, didn't matter. I I could have put him over as champion. He would have found something. <laughs> just one of those people. Did yeah. he like get in the ring and wrestle? Oh, there's a couple yeah. times he has. Yeah, he did. No. Yeah, oh, he, yeah. I think he, he, he spent a lot of time managing, which wasn't any better. No, I, guess not. I love watching Louis. He's one of my favorite local wrestling stories. <laughs> I really enjoy him. <laughs> local wrestling disasters. <laughs> 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 So to, to, to wrap up the program, we, we like to, to ask about some specific memories you may have from your time in the business. Um, who was the shittiest guy you were ever in the ring with? Probably my very first match, Chris Wall. Chris Wall? Yeah, it was a fucking disaster. Was that your worst match or the shittiest guy you've been in the ring with? Both. Both? Wow, Both. two birds with one stone. Well, at least you got it way early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why, was, why, why was this one individual worse than anybody else you've encountered over the years? Uh, he didn't get the business to begin with. 
didn't didn't realize anything about it. Just went in there and thought, well, I'm going to hit this guy as hard as I can and try and kill him, and uh, for you know nine ten minutes and uh, <laughs> unfortunately I was on the receiving end of it. So. Well, how long did he last for? Where is he now? <laughs> uh, probably a half a dozen shows and never came back. Yeah, I would imagine somebody kicked the shit out of him. Well, uh, Tony took his money and then never booked him anymore, put it that way. Fair enough. <laughs> So you, you you know spanned a long time you know ninety ninety two to, to you know two thousand sixteen. There's been many changes in direction of professional wrestling in that time. Many changes to styles of professional wrestling. Um, you know now you know twenty five years later. Um, how do you find it is adjusting to all the adjustments in professional wrestling in terms of the pace, the style? Um, do you stick to your guns, or is it something you try to you know make a point to try to, to stay relevant in? Well, I, I definitely think it's changed from when I started. It was all, the pace was a lot slower back then. Uh, a lot more emphasis on, uh, emphasis on you know selling the move rather than you know go 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 go. It's it's over kind of thing. I, I try to keep relevant with it, but you know I, I'm not 28, 29 like you guys are anymore. So man, I've been I, I, this I, age, so I don't know. I don't know that's a... <laughs> I, I, I do my best. While I, I worked you at rookies, and I, just, I after the show I had a heart attack, and I was yelling at something. <laughs> I wanted to talk about something that we haven't had somebody on the on the, the program with is you've actually you know you have some family involved or kind of kind of got involved in the business. You're one of those unlucky men that had your daughter date a professional wrestler. Oh yeah. So what was your first reaction to hearing that you know your baby girl's dating one of the boys? Because we're all scumbags, so <laughs> it couldn't have been a happy thought when the first first. Well, I what talked was, to I I talked to her about it. And she seemed to think he was a real nice guy. She wanted me to meet him. So she worked him good. Or he worked her good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I met him, and to me, he seemed like a nice guy. I didn't know him very well. Yeah. And then later on down the road, she had broken up with him, and I said, what happened? I said, well, he was out on tour, and he cheated on me. So I said, well, okay, if I ever see him, that'll be the last time I'd be allowed to have to worry about him. So, <laughs> so, I mean, that was a long time ago, and to this day, I still have heat with him. I thought, you know, not only... You disrespected her, you disrespected me because I give you my blessing to go out with her. So you've never run into him since? Uh, lucky for him. I'm surprised you even let it happen in the first place because when you tell me the story that he cheated on her on tour, like you had to know that was coming. No matter how nice of a guy you thought he was, you're like, the boys are going to be the boys. I'm surprised you didn't you know, put a gun to his head. Well, this, his lesson. <laughs> this, this was when I was living down in the States, so I wasn't privy to see everything that was going on. Okay. But I found about it later on. Okay, and you've now inherited another, uh, you know, wrestling family member. The uh, we're kind of family now. Yeah. As, as weird as that sounds, as yeah. you're dating uh, my my former auntie was married to my uncle. Yeah. And she is the mother of Winnipeg wrestling legend Ricky Cena. So, by way of that, you are the stepdad of Ricky Cena. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I am. Which makes us almost related. Which means him like your uncle, sort of? Sort of, yeah. yeah sort of like it uncle. makes him like my uncle, Uncle Todd. Uncle Bullet. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you spent a lot of time with Ricky? Are you molding him into to the wrestling star he wants to be? Uh, no, he's got his own style. He's got his own style? Yeah. style. He's got a style you just can't work on. It's no. No. <laughs> Blinders. One direction. Let's, let's go this way. No, I'm going this way. <laughs> Okay, if you want to be a shoot fighter, go ahead. Well, it's legitimate. Uh, <laughs> to, to, to close off the, the program, we were talking about all kinds of you know legends you've worked with in the past before the program started. The likes of Brian Jewell, Kerry Brown. There's got to be some great stories from being on the road with those guys. Send us home with a with a good good story from your time with with the likes of those guys. Uh, okay, with. well, uh, we were wrestling uh, Northern Manitoba somewhere, uh, working for Tony. And they had our, our locker room was in the, the beer cooler. Imagine that, a group of wrestlers in yeah. a beer cooler. <laughs> and that is more times oh. than you think. It's ridiculous. Well, and, 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 <laughs> and, then, and then they get hot when there's liquor gone missing. Yeah. Well, the, the, the sick part was the guy said if you want if you want some booze, you know, it's free. <laughs> so, oh, that, that was a mistake. Don't, don't quote me on it. I think it was Dean Ducharme. He said, Oh, that's okay, I don't want anything to drink. 
And Carrie Brown grabs him by the scruff of the neck, pulls him back. He says, don't be a stupid son of a bitch. If someone offers you a drink and you don't want it, take it and give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Carrie was the first person to rib me with a prairie fire shot, which is Tabasco ah. sauce and tequila. Mm -hmm. I was 16 years old or 17 years old. Or I think I was 17. 17 years old, we were on tour with Ernie in Saskatchewan and we stopped in some small shithole town that we were staying the night in and, and Carrie offered to buy me a shot. I was like, wow, that's really cool. Carrie Brown's buying me a shot. No. Nope. I, I thought that was wonderful. Like, Thank you, Carrie. And shoot back that shot of alcohol and the next thing I know, my mouth is on fire and I'm crying on my knees <laughs> for something <laughs> to chase it back. But I remember it was actually Northern Manitoba, they did that to us too. We had an after party sponsor in Flin Flon, it's called Berkey's. And the guy was really cool, he liked partying with the boys and just all kinds of shit went down after hours. He closed the bar down, all the boys stayed and, and, and drank and Merck got into a fight with, with a referee that had to be pulled apart. But he did the same thing where he said, guys, drinks are on me tonight. And this guy ran a full bar. And by the time 7 o'clock in the morning rolled around, he did not have one drop of liquor <laughs> left in his bar and had zero inventory to open up the next day. So, I'm guessing you guys weren't invited back? We didn't go back after that. <laughs> we didn't uh, by choice on our own. So, <laughs> so carry on, Todd. Um, yeah, a couple of, couple other quick stories. Uh, I was wrestling Gene Swan, Southern Manitoba, somewhere I forget the town. Uh, it was an outdoor show, and with me being a, a heel, uh, one of the one of the lovely fans in, in attendance thought it'd be a good idea to pick up a rock about the size of a baseball and throw it at me. <laughs> <laughs> Turned around, Jeez. hit hit me in the eye. I ended up with a shiner for a couple of weeks. Oh, man. That, that that was always nice. Oh. <laughs> uh, another time, uh, wrestling up in Peguis Indian Reserve. It was the dead of winter, like February. It was like, you know, minus 100 below. So what it is today. Yeah. Yep. So there's me, Brian Jewell, Dean Ducharme. Uh, can't think of it. A couple other guys. All crammed in. He had like one of them little Datsuns about this big. No heat in it, you know, for like a four-hour winter drive. <laughs> Go up there. He went down some back road the wrong way. Got stuck. We all had to get up and push. You know, everybody's wearing runners. So, of course, then your feet are frozen with no heat. <laughs> get to the building in Paguas, they hadn't even turned the heat on in the building yet. So you got a half a dozen guys who went in the kitchen, they opened the two oven doors and turned them on full blast. Everybody's like trying to warm up so they could like feel their fingers. Which, which wasn't as bad as, as wrestling in a jacket in reserve. That, that was a crazy reserve. Uh, Bob Brown decided it would be a good idea to, you know, do do some kind of Indian dance and make fun of them, <laughs> which, caught, which caused the riot. And there was probably about 50 chairs got thrown into the ring. Oh, wow. And we were locked in the locker behind a steel door, had like wire mesh over the glass and stuff. This was lovely. They had to call the RCMP in to, you know, come get us out of there alive. <laughs> and this was early on, so I'm like, well, this is a nice business to be in. <laughs> For fans that want to follow you on social media or promoters out there that want to book Todd Bullet, how do they find you if they want to interact with you online and get in touch? Uh, they can try my email at uh, allstar underscore wrestling at yahoo.com. Sounds like a wrestling promotion. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> it works for me. It works for you. Todd, thank you very much for coming on the program. It was a blast. No problem. If we find Wild Man Furpo, if he's alive, if his wife hasn't murdered him, or if he's not engaging in uh, affairs with Sarah Foster at a future date, we'll <laughs> get him down here and we'll get the two of you together and we'll tell some of these stories again. <laughs> we'll see everybody next week. It's a trap!